Friday, everyone. I am Chris Gore from Film Threat. This is another one of our Film Threat watch parties. You are in for a treat today. We are going to watch Ethan Minsker's documentary, Man in Camo, with a whole group of people. I'm, I'm making final adjustments. I'm grabbing drinks, which I, I hope that you will do too. So uh, grab your iPad, your computer, your your system, however you're going to watch the movie. Look up Man in Camo. It's on Amazon Prime, Vudu, iTunes, Google Play Store. You can get it on Xbox. It's kind of on everything. So look it up, get ready as we start another Film Threat Watch Party. Happy Friday, everyone. We all made it to the weekend. I am excited to show you and present to you a documentary that I have fallen in love with. I interviewed Ethan Minsker for the Film Threat podcast. I have known about Ethan's work, um, God, forever. I don't know. It just, he, he's, he's, uh, Ethan's a, a, a staple and a, a figure in independent film. Um, and especially films that are wildly creative, like the documentary that he made. So let's talk to Ethan right now. I'm going to introduce the group we're watching the movie with today. Ethan, how are you, man? I'm good. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing good. You're the man. <laughs> you're you're actually wearing camo right now, which is which is fitting, perfect. You are dressed perfectly for the evening. I am. And uh, for the people who don't know, it's going to be your birthday tomorrow. So happy birthday. Oh well, thank you. I will. I will, uh, well, in lieu of being having someone buy my buy me a drink, I'm just going to have a drink of my own. Well, you deserve it. Oh, yes. Well, thank you. <laughs> I'm Ethan Minsker. I'm the filmmaker. Uh, this film is going to have a lot of animation in it. It's handcrafted. It took me five years. Um, it has a lot of people in it. A, lot of the, a few of the people you're going to see here uh, talking about it and talking smack about me. So let's get ready. Strap let's, in. Let's get ready. I do want to remind people, too, uh, that you can comment live as you watch Man and Camo with us. Um, we will post your comments. I'll be doing shout outs to people who post comments. If you have questions about the movie, questions for Ethan or any of the people who are involved in the film, uh, ask us. So post a comment. I'm going to uh, let's let's bring everybody on. Let's just bring on the whole gang. We have a full house today. This is awesome. I love it. The more the merrier. So here we are. Let's bring on Ted, Shane, Dahlia, Edgar, and I can't I can't read I can't read I can't read everybody's name. Can everybody uh, in, introduce themselves across uh, starting with Ted. Hey everybody, I'm Ted Riederer coming at you from New York City. I'm an artist and musician and I've known Ethan forever. I have so many stories about Ethan. So many. And a lot of them all good. A lot of them are sketchy. <laughs> <laughs> He's the best though. Most loyal friend I have, pretty much. That's not saying that much. Hmm. Oh, damn. All right. I guess I'll go next. I'm Shane Comet. Um, I've known Ethan for a few years now since we work at the same company. And um, I've seen much of his process of making Man and Camel like firsthand because I helped shoot some of it and I've just been helping him make edi editorial choices. So I've seen it grow and change over a period of time. But glad to be here. Cool. I'll go next. Um, I'm Dahlia. I've also known Ethan forever, over 20 years. Um, and he's been one of my favorite people and a constant source of inspiration forever. Um, I, uh, I write about movies and I've actually written for Ethan's zine, which is one of the longest running zines I know of. Um, and uh, there's actually an excerpt from one of my books on Film Threat. If you uh, Google going viral, you can find something that I wrote. But yes, that is Ethan Zine. Um, and uh, this movie is a treasure. If you've never seen it before, you're in for a treat. Great. Okay, my name is James uh, Rubio. And um, basically, like, the only reason my art's relevant is because of Ethan Miska and oh, wow. his damn camera. Uh, filming everything all the time because 
Otherwise, I don't think that, you know, if a tree falls in the woods, right? Nobody hears it. That's right. If a tree shits in the wood, nobody tastes it. <laughs> <laughs> and we have two mystery boxes. Who are our mystery boxes? Are, are you, you guys, are you here to, to just uh, hang out and listen? Or will you reveal yourselves? Hey! <laughs> Um, that, yeah, that's me. <laughs> Edgar, tell us. Um, I'm just a student of Dalias, <laughs> <laughs> Professor Dalias, and I thought I was actually really interested in actually watching the movie Man and Camel, and see what's that, uh, what the whole hype is about. <laughs> cool, cool. Yeah, hi, my name is John. The party. Um, I'm uh, also a student of Dalias, and I. Uh, yeah, I really liked your presentation today, and I uh, I'm excited to watch the movie. So. Awesome, cool. So this morning I talked to Dahlia's class at FIT, and this is some of the students. We got a whole house here now. <laughs> Did you guys I, make it to New York, or are you uh, remoting in from some other place? I'm from Queens, New York. <laughs> nice, me too. Uh, I'm from Long Island. Uh, Nice. Great. Uh, cool. So uh, what uh, we have to do a little intro to the movie, just as a reminder to people, you can get Man and Camo now on Amazon Prime, Vudu, uh, Google Play, Xbox, everywhere you get your video on demand movies. I bought, I bought it on Vudu, actually. I don't know. I just, uh, that's where my digital collection lives. And, and so that's that's how I built my digital collection. So uh, wherever you purchase it, we're all going to, just as a reminder to people, get the movie queued up so we can all watch it at the same time. I've got it like ready to press, press play. So, so everyone else like get the movie ready, get ready to press play. We'll, we'll be doing that in about seven or eight minutes. Um, so that's, that's your, that's your reminder. Um, Ethan, what can you tell people if, if this were say a film festival screening, right? And you were doing an intro, what would you tell people about this film? So this film is a very meta documentary, a self portrait, portrait and artist statement. So the same way an artist might do a self portrait, you're learning, you're experimenting. I took this time as an opportunity to do a documentary the way I sort of dreamed and envisioned to do a new style of art documentaries where the documentary itself is a piece of artwork. So all the animation and crazy things I do, I wouldn't necessarily do with another artist or subject until I tested it out and tried it on myself. So as you see, it's very art directed. Almost every scene is art directed. Everyone's gonna be wearing the camo suit. Everyone is gonna be in the black background. The background is the void and the whole kind of story is about being afraid of death. And that's what drives me creatively. So I would say, I know it seems very self-indulgent and it absolutely is. It's a very <laughs> meta film. Absolutely agree with that. But I learned a lot through the process of making this film. And it has fundamentally changed the style and progressed what I do. If you see some of my older films, like Self Medicated, a film about art, which Ted is in, whoops, sorry, Ted is in, and James is in, um, you would see that some of this style is in there, where some animation, a little bit of paper animation, stop motion, but this film is like accelerating that 100%. When I screen the film at other festivals, past films, the one comment, and even Ted has said this, like, you should add more animation, add more animation. So I went full stop on this one and just fully animated this thing like crazy. I love how James is driving right now. So <laughs> if he gets in an accident, it's like, if James crashed and died in the middle of the watch party, first ever. Well, if you get a, I, yeah, if you get a ticket, keep, keep going. That's funny because we've had we've had like dogs and cats on the on, on this. We've had like we've had like crazy stuff happen. We've never had anyone driving during the watch party. I'm actually gonna take Edgar and John. I, I appreciate you showing up, but I'm gonna I'm gonna take you off the live stream there. 
uh, so you can like, but you can still watch along with with all of us. Um, but this this is just oh look now we're now we're, we're we're larger here. Where did you get? Is that a 3D printed version of you? Yeah, so I did of it a is. thing called <laughs> what? We, all of you guys don't have 3D printed versions of yourself. I thought you guys like action figures. So I use these as part of the thing that I animated. I, I actually went to a place called Dobbs and had myself 3D printed. And then I could flip and animate between these two. And now I just love having them. I can play with my action figures and be a part of that Star Wars set. So Gabriel has a comment. Uh, I don't know. Maybe you know Gabriel personally. Love Gabriel. Uh, no, I think it's Gabriel from uh, Ecuador. Ecuador. Oh, nice, cool. Uh, what? So, what else? If you were like, I, I know. Um, I mean, the amazing thing about this, I can think of a handful of documentaries that the subject is also the filmmaker. There's um, Dogtown and Z Boys, directed by Stacy Peralta, which is really about the birth and uh, of, of skateboarding culture and how it exploded. I saw that at Sundance years ago, and um, I found that fascinating, but I really can't think of many other documentaries other than maybe the work of Nick Broomfield. I don't know if anyone is familiar with um, Nick Broomfield as a documentary filmmaker, but he often ends up weaving himself into the subject matter, but, but it's not all about him necessarily. Um, I've always found Nick Broomfield uh, to be a fascinating filmmaker. And uh, Brittany asks, uh, are, are the action figures available on Amazon Prime? Um, no, that's Shane's girlfriend. Yeah. That's awesome. that's, I like how there's a picture of her on there. That's awesome. That's, that's her Facebook, yeah. But, but can you... Um, so when she comes, when she used to come visit Shane at work, the one thing I would do every day is like, well, Brittany, nice to see you. Let me give you a nice hug. A nice and awkward hug. In the yeah. Shane's eyes as long as possible. And she would just let me do it for a very long time because we both knew it would drive Shane nuts. Yeah, it was very fine. awesome. So I just thought I would put that out there. But I wonder, are there are there any other documentary films like this type? I've I've never heard of that. I was going to see if Dolly had something. To say. There's um, I when I was in my the master's program, we watched a whole thing on this guy who did early um, video diaries, where he would just do these like films, forty minute films, interviewing himself about his own life, which was kind of like the precursor to the confessionals that you see in these like uh, reality TV shows. So, I mean, I've seen a, a few other films where there's documentaries, I can't recall the name, but it's almost like this thing where inside of New York, it's totally acceptable to make a film about yourself. Only in New York. You go outside of New York, everyone thinks you're a little bit weird that you would dare to make a film about yourself. But, it's one of those things where nobody is going to care about what I have done unless I'm represented by a major gallery or super famous. I find value in the weird things I do. I find value in the weird artists that I cover. So I'm going to document it. And because I made a series of these films showing like Ted and me and James and all of us documenting all the weird art projects we've done around the world, you know, feature after feature, the comment I always got back from other filmmakers was that you need to be a bigger voice of this film. And I was resistant because we're part of a collaborative group. So I said, this time, I'm hell, I'll just separate this out. I'll go full stop on me. And then from now on, I'm just going to do one subject for each weird art documentary. Well, I, I think it works in the, in the sense that, not to ruin anything about the movie, but you kind of call yourself out. In fact, a lot. James actually. calls me out, actually. <laughs> yeah, but like you, you, you call <laughs> yourself out. Both Ted <laughs> and James have the ability to always keep me in check, or my ego would. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think that's true. <laughs> <laughs> it would be bigger. Well, I think we're reaching the point where we should start the movie. This is this is where it it, uh, it begins. So, if you are watching this, wherever you're watching this, I'm going to assume you have man and camo in front of you in some form, so you can play it and watch along with us. If you have any questions, whether you're watching it or not, 
Uh, jump in and ask a question, post a comment. We will post your comments live here. Uh, I, I'm excited for us to all watch this movie. Does everyone does everyone have it queued up? Mm -hmm. Yep. Queued up. Okay, ready? Three, two, one, play. And you said now it's streaming on Facebook? Oh, our watch party is streaming on Facebook, yes. On the Film Threat Facebook page or my Facebook page. And here we are. I see you in a suit. How is that all that title animation done? The title sequence, the, the first five minutes is breathless. And, and I will say, if you're watching this, I had to pause the movie at the 55 second mark when I first watched it. And I was like, I can't believe how much information was condensed in the first 55 seconds of this movie. I was, I can't believe how much I've learned. And then I paused it just because I wanted to see and it was 55 seconds. It kind of blew my mind how much you learn. So what is that like, that condensation of all this information? It's kind of wild. Well, that's Shane going, this is a little slow. Can you speed it up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah, pretty much some parts just like- Really? We, oh, we, need, some, we need some oomph, we need some like punch <laughs> some parts, you know? Shane nice. is a very um, adept at um editing very good fast quick ed editor thank you um yeah in the very first sequence when you saw the photos that took about three weeks to line up every single photo to have my head pointing the same direction same sort of shape in the same timeline so just that little flickering part where you see me age through photos took a very long time to do I'm yep. still looking for the watch party on Facebook, I'm trying to repost it. I'm looking oh. at the uh, uh, film threat one. Or you can go to my page or um, the film threat page. It should be live on there. But um, th what I like is not just the animation, but the different styles of animation. There's stop motion, claymation. There's um, you know cutout animation. There's, I mean, it's just it's almost like every style I, the, my the first movies i ever made when i was a kid is i made clay clay animated movies so, and i've seen yours oh that's oh that's right you might have seen one or two yeah there's yeah some stuff posted now wait your your mom is in this yeah um how did you get your mom to to agree to this she's awesome <laughs> <laughs> My mom has been, you know, she's a lawyer and she's helped out a lot of people in legal problems. I don't know if she's helped Ted with any, you know, she did do some legal she stuff. She did, yeah. Ted. Lots of free legal stuff. I owe her big time. Um, my family is very good and supportive for, you know, I'm kind of the black sheep, like pretty much everyone in my family are all lawyers. My sister used to be one of the top ACLU lawyers uh, for death penalty policy for the state of California. My mom was a big uh, banking attorney, you know, my cousins, everyone. So I'm kind of the black sheep weirdo artist type. So they seem to tolerate my weirdness. Um, my father still hasn't watched the film and I'm a little like nervous about him watching it, but my mom's seen it and, you know, enjoyed it. She just basically is very good about, hey mom, come in here, put on the camo suit, sit here, I'm going to ask you some questions, and she's a good sport about it. I'm a baby boy. What else are you going to do? <laughs> and I love this thing where you're, you, you not, this is what's interesting. You're not just showing this interesting animation. You're showing how you're doing the animation, where you were painting all of those figures in that, in that one scene. I mean, just like, at least for me, like 20 seconds ago. Yeah. Yeah, Maybe. that, like. So, so you're showing the results, you're showing the how. It's, I mean, it's sort of beyond that, right? Like when you're doing stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I like the concept of learning something that you're watching. So when you're watching, you're doing a, um, a documentary or a film or whatever, like it shouldn't just be somebody telling their story. There should be moments that inspire you and also 
teachable moments that you can replicate, if that makes sense. Yeah. There's the vagina scene. That the scene that just played is a film I made with Catherine Lyons that Ted Yay. made, <laughs> and uh, I had them as if they were getting birth. It was like one of these things of like, don't smoke cigarettes, pregnant mothers, or you'll have stillborn babies. So I actually had footage of them like going through a fake vagina that I made. <laughs> Watch it for the fake vaginas. <laughs> My daughter's in the next room listening to this. So. Oh, no. <laughs> I, I want to ask, your, your daughter's in the film. Uh, we haven't seen her yet. She's more in the third act, but um, I'm, what, what shot is, in the head. I'm curious what she thinks of this movie. Um, I love, I love, I mean, maybe we should wait until we get to that part, but. Blue, come here. Come here, quick. Come on. <laughs> Just tell them what you think of the movie, Man and Camo. Get in here. Just say, you like it or hate it? <laughs> She's never watched the whole thing. And she's like, <laughs> I, I, we went to film festivals and I brought her and she came for the Q and A. And I specifically told my mother not to bring her till after a certain marker because I talk about ex-girlfriends and, you know, dating life and all of that. <laughs> and my mother, of course, brought her in. So my daughter brought her in early. So my daughter got to watch that whole section and then about her. So now <laughs> she gets, she asked me the other day, how many, um, how many, um, how many girlfriends have you had? <laughs> oh, no. nice. Yeah. So thanks, Granny. I'm pretty sure you broke up with all of them. Of course I broke up with all of them. I'm married to your mom right now. It'd be a little weird if I wasn't. And this is the mask I made for her. Oh, wow. One thing I was going to say is you can't be Ethan's friend or family member and sit on the sidelines. At some point during your friendship, you will be on a plane holding a camera, doing other crazy stuff, hopping a fence, pouring paint out of an abandoned window in Berlin. It's just uh, one of the great things about being his friend is he kind of forces you to push your limits. And um, we've just had a blast together all over the world, um, all, all on our own initiative and, and our own prerogative. But uh, it's just been a wonderful uh experience being his friend and that's the last nice thing i'll say about him tonight <laughs> oh, God. I, I even had james one time we made this project called the uh, rat house project and had james well james was adept really skilled at climbing over fences so he's basically i have footage of him breaking into this lot and um laying out all these rat houses we made for this project that was out on 14th street for a couple of weeks so yeah i get them all to commit crimes that was a fun that was a fun project that was a good project i don't know that i've committed crimes but i've definitely been recruited to hold microphones and dress like a slut and be an extra Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> in a film called the uh, soft hustle that uh, we'll put some clips of later that's a great um, film there's a lot of good performances in that yeah, it's it's a very uh, yeah. Well, anyway, I get I, I get Shane to um, constantly help with projects. The film's yeah. quality has vastly gone up because you know we both at where employer has cameras and they yeah. end up stuff. I, and I think I don't know once, what Shane wants to say about it. I think once Ethan found out that I actually like do like shooting like cinematography and stuff like that is like all right how am i gonna get him involved now and it and it's, it's been like a blast like just watching him work and his process and like shooting all his art and how he operates in terms of what he wants to get because he knows what he needs and he he'll do like anything to get it you know as long as it works for his film or his like creativity well, tell them that also, like, there was a point where Jeremy, who's, I asked him for this thing, but he wasn't available, and Shane kind of cornered me and were like, you know, you should just stop working on Man in Camo. Like, it's done. Just Because what I would do is stop. I would get into a festival, screen the film, watch how the audience reacts, make changes visually, not to the audio track, 
And then for the next festival, I would stream a new version. So this film literally never showed the same at any festival. It's only now the same because the distributor has it and he's wrenched it from my hands. <laughs> they basically tried to have an intervention it, and have that now. Ethan's Ethan's motto constantly was just like I gotta make it a little bit better. I gotta make it a little bit better. <laughs> like I don't know how many times I heard him say that. I can but, hear you know, him saying that. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like, like, like I always said we're rate, we're trying to get to an eight. Like that's the goal. You're never gonna make a ten when it comes to the rating. And then film threat rates it. And look what look at that. I got like a nine. So a little bit better. Just a little <laughs> bit See, better. it works. Well, it's. I feel like Ethan, you and George Lucas would get along really well. So uh, maybe, maybe there could be a special edition of the movie, you know, in ten years. He's he's a guy that like it's like you know movies aren't done; they're abandoned. So, yeah, except I would have definitely shot first. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's a Han Solo reference. Yeah, that's yeah, what, I've seen the movie. I had an amazing painting teacher named Will Inslee, who's since passed away. And I asked him how he knew a painting was finished, and he said, when it stops bothering you. I thought that was a great quote. Oh, oh that's a good, that's good. I just feel like this is so, this movie is so much about, not just about Ethan, but about art and the creative process and struggling to express yourself, but also just using what, it's like what Mark Duplass says, you know, the cavalry isn't coming use what you have and what you did with what you have is amazing. It's not just the story of a life. It's a story about being creative. And I, I love movies. I'm always been attracted to that kind of movie. It's I, because it's, it's a subject that's, you know, not explored particularly often in film. Mm -hmm. so, I'm this right now. Yeah. yeah. I think we're in sync. Yeah. Do you I'd have like a bunch of people watching? You have a bunch of people watching in Ecuador, Ethan. It's pretty cool. <laughs> I know. I saw Vera commented. So on this, <laughs> it, just, it just showed this part of the movie, and I'd like to explain that. You know, it's animated, yes, but what I did is I made 24 individual sculptural paintings that then I animated together. So that took about a month just to create that scene that just played that was about literally like less than 10 seconds. So you I think, yeah, you, it cost me nothing because I did it myself, but the insanity of it is that if you want to make stuff a little bit better, you have to have the commitment to be able to invest the time. And this, I'm going to show you this because I like, this is one of my, the books that you'll see later in the film. And uh, every page is animated. So you, if, when you see it, you'll recognize it, but it's like, if somebody's talking about publishing their own books or the print world that can be very boring so what i wanted to do is really amp up the visuals of something that can be inherently boring talking about books <laughs> how long, did it, how long did it take you to archive everything but clearly this came from not just a personal archive of films you've made but you know personal photos family photos family home movies like, how long did that archiving process take? And do you have any tips? <laughs> For someone who yeah, might say, asking I, I'm just that. very, like, I could lose a lot of things in, in, you know, moving and things like that, but I'm very careful in keeping the stuff that I created. That's the one thing you can't replace. You can replace, you know, a book, you can replace clothing, but you can't replace your own memories. So, and also I realized that well, like when my grandfather died, it's like those memories kind of get tossed away, right? So they're gone. I want to compress it and use it all into some, some sort of project. And even when I was a kid, I kept, you know, my fanzines that I made when I was seven and every video I ever made. And early on when I was using Betamax, the very first Betamax camcorders, the Sony 100 or whatever it was, um, I was told that playing the tapes back and forth can ruin the quality of the tape. So I really only showed those once to like the people that did it. And then, you know, I just kept it in pristine condition. So I basically been archiving my whole life. And my wife would tell you that for sure. She hates that. That's called You're a hoarder. 
I'm a hoarder. <laughs> you're a hoarder. hoarder. No, That's you're a short of it. You're a digital hoarder. That's what you are. My basement is full of Ethan's crap. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, we lost James. One there, I think, is there a Rhode Island one? I'm back, I'm back. He I committed a robbery. Anything. I was going to say, like, something is going to, uh, there's a mystery going on with James. So James, I'm, I'm, the killer's right behind you. <laughs> this is typical of James. I go, he's like, yeah, I'll definitely do a watch party. And then I text him, like, you're doing the watch party. He's like, oh, yeah, I'm doing it. I'm ready. Not home, not ready. But that's better. I like him moving. This is just how James is. Yes. That's, I'm, I'm running around. I'm sorry, guys. You, you, be, you should at least I'm be almost, interviewing I'm the man on the afraid. street. I love showing the silk screening because I remember doing like film thread t-shirts years ago. We would just use a stencil and spray paint because I couldn't afford to get, that's the punk rock way of doing things, right? Like you just make a stencil and just spray paint it. I still have a jacket that I do. But like, I love you showing that. Like you're not just showing the results, you're showing the creative process, which is here's how silk screen shirts are made. Yeah, I mean, I think probably in the last four features we have some sort of clip of somebody silk screening i used to do i used to do a lot of merch for bands um in dc for desiderata all the way up to h2o here in new york and so i was the guy not not always creating the shirts but at least selling the shirts and a lot of the times creating the shirts and then through the antagonist movement which there's going to be a lot of clips of that you know having my entire apartment floors covered in shirts that were drying you know i i think it's there's like in certain enjoyable things when you're doing old school punk rock and that's like making a t-shirt you know basically making the branding for a band putting flyers up physical flyers up in a neighborhood you know those are the things that i feel like maybe is missing nowadays days from some art sort of creative thing that sort of hand to hand combat when it when it's you know promoting your artwork whether it's a t-shirt or a flyer well it's everything is so digital these days in terms of creativity that i still like for myself i still like to do weird craft projects just because why not you know you had your your 3d printed i have like this thing i'll just show you real quick it's in the background it's <laughs> it's a um it's a Han Solo in carbonite, but it's my life cast of my face grafted onto it. So I know it looks you very. You know strange. when when they want to do your gravestone, they yeah, just slap that right on the top of that. That's where that's where it goes. But it's a weird curiosity. But yeah, no, I, I that's what I love about this film, Ethan, is the sort of handmade nature of it. It's kind of like. You know, Monty Python, if you watch Monty Python, the original television show, Monty Python, how they would do like the paper cutout animation. Yeah. And it, I mean, it's hand done. It's, you know, you know. I, I'm looking at myself at a table, my dad's office. Yeah, I like that. I grew up watching Monty Python. I'm very inspired by the great rock and roll swindle. Um, oh, wow. You know, in a... Um, all those kind of like very handcrafted movies. I'd rather see that than a highly polished CGI in a big Hollywood blockbuster. I'm always seeking out those very handcrafted movies. Right now is a section in the film, if you're watching, is the fanzine thing. This is one of my latest ones that's not in the movie. The one pager. Hmm. Oh, wow. Look at that, one piece of paper. I love the animals. I know people like the animal drawings. They're good. From oh, a sketchbook. James is back. Oh, James, what's the update? <laughs> James, look out! Look out! I'm back. I'm 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 good. I'm back. I'm I'm, I'm okay. You robbed What hotel thing? did you, are you in? Huh? What hotel is that? Uh, the standard. Are you in the standard? Yeah, look at the bathroom. Oh. I, it, it is the standard. That is not your apartment. No, this ain't, this ain't my apartment. This is my, my, my East Village home for the weekend right now. 
Oh, nice. Very nice. Rubio, little Rubio. Rubio. Yeah, you know, but I live in I live upstate now, so I, I stay in hotels when I'm when I'm working. I would like to say that there's something that Chris kind of mentioned before, at one time. I think we had in a conversation that a lot of what you do creatively um, encompasses your family of people and friends that you know. And I could say, you know, like, well, Ted, I grew up with in D.C., so I've known him since I was like 15. But James, I know through doing this art movement, he was roommates with Arturo Vega. And Arturo brought him in like, hey, here's a puppy. Take this puppy and make it. He does art, you he know. The best. And then Shane is somebody that I know from work, but I really connect through him through the collaborative efforts that we do. We do podcasts together. We do a bunch of shorts. We do, like, it's not just this film, you know, a whole lot of weird stuff. And I feel like almost my whole social fabric revolves about around creativity. Dahlia, too. That's like, you know, she's a professor at FIT, and I'm lucky enough that she brings me in and I can talk to the students and bore, their, bore them to death. <laughs> The students love you. They all added me on Instagram, so I think that's pretty good. <laughs> it's like right after I, again, so the people I talk to FIT students today, and then like 10 added me right away on Instagram. And it's actually really sad because pre-COVID, we were going to have a massive exhibition of Ethan's artwork at FIT this fall. And now it's postponed because nobody's at FIT this fall. And showing man in camo, camo there. And showing man in camo. Now I'm stabbing the zine. If anyone is watching, it's at the mark where I'm stabbing the fanzine. And then me as a young person doing my... I used to do a lot of skits ah, in my yeah. basement. And I know Chris can relate to this because I've seen his videos of this too. But, you know, as a social misfit, I had a beta camera and I would set it up on a tripod and I would film myself coming up with all these weird, whatever skit I would come up with at the time. And the whole man in camo thing, like when you watch it, there's a lot of interviews, but the reality is, is 80% of that, I'm completely by myself talking to a camera, no one else in the apartment. So I haven't really evolved much since I was like, you know, 11 years old, 13 years old, making films in my basement. But that doesn't that make you feel creative in the sense that like you're not burdened by I mean, as much as like we're all adults and pay our bills, I'm sure for the most part, although who knows now with the world on fire. Um, but like there's a weird like and I, I feel I, I, I really relate to what you just said, because it's like there's still like this part of me that's still like a 12 year old that wants to like just, you know, think creatively um about in, in terms of that approach you know what i mean like not be burdened by that sort of by adult concerns um today i was in the playground with my kid today and the other mother <laughs> i was with said you know you're basically a kid and <laughs> i have to agree yeah. i haven't really grown up and i still really love you know coming up with weird projects whatever they might be whether it's like you know making a pink car for something else, you know, putting myself inside there. Um, <laughs> whatever your imagination leads you, I feel is the place to go. So it might be a film or a book or a script or performance art or a podcast with Shane. Um, I feel like that's, you should always just go with whatever your passion leads you. There's probably nothing, you know, and it makes you feel good. Maybe no one else is going to care, but it makes you feel good, you know? And growing up is overrated. <laughs> it's, so, you know, like when you were a kid, you always think like growing up is like, I don't know, like growing up is like now I make adult decisions and I talk like this and I wear a suit and I go to a job. But I realize that uh, growing up is none of those things. It's you you still can be the idiot that you are and do all the same sort of stuff. You just still have to, you know, you have to have a day job. That's it. You can be an but, idiot there. And you can have whatever you want for dinner. Yeah. yeah. Like cereal. Lunch. Like you can have cereal for dinner because or I'm cookies. an adult. It's so true. 
Salute! <laughs> That's another. So we did a film in Ecuador, um, me and James, and a, a lot of the comments we're getting are from a lot of the artists that we worked with in Ecuador. If you watch our other film, self-medicated, a film about art, not that I'm supposed to pitch to the other film, but you can find that on Amazon Prime and all of that stuff too. But a lot of these artists that are making comments are also the same artists that are featured in that film. James, definitely make sure the camera is looking up your nose. It's the most flattering. Sorry, I don't. I don't have a. <laughs> Uh, 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 you know, one of those things to hold the camera. It also sounds like you're opening a jar of lube or something. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I At least put it on camera. Yeah. It was yeah, more yeah. exciting when you were doing the man on the street coverage. <laughs> <laughs> and Shane, why do you have some satanic thing behind you? So oh, you know what that's from. You, know, you that. know what that's from. Is that from the record thing we did? No, that's from my, uh, my thesis film. Oh, right. Shane is a filmmaker too, and he made a very funny kind of office goes to hell. If like I would dark explain comedy that. thing. Yeah. Me and Shane did a podcast, a whole series called Dubious Conclusion. So if you want to hear our comedy side, you could probably find that. Or if you want to just like hear our personal, like funny side, then listen to Ear Trash on Spotify. Yeah. Ear Trash is on Spotify. That's the name yeah, of so the you your Trash. Ear trash. ear trash. That's the name of the ear, ear trash. trash. Okay. Yeah. It's nothing but trash. Yeah, I'm it's, it's garbage. It now, <laughs> now that the film is showing a clip of me bashing a skateboard, and when I did that, a big chunk of wood went right into my chin, and I was bleeding everywhere. <laughs> and a lot of these clips that you see in the film are from other shorts and animated stuff I did. I looked on my Vimeo account, and I have almost 300 shorts. You know that sometimes they're documentary, but animation and everything. Patio in Georgetown, right there. Yeah, that I. So when growing up in D.C., I had this kind of like party house in Georgetown, where I had the first floor, so people would come over and drink and do their party, and then we would all drive off to go to the shows. Ear trash, yeah, double That's like it. that. There's no new episodes. <laughs> but there's twelve like, good ones, I think. <laughs> no, we had we had three well, episodes, we and the, there's three in the pike that never came out. Because COVID happened, and then everything just fell apart. <laughs> so this is uh, now in the film. It's showing a part where I'm running through the woods outside of Chicago, and I animated a monster. The my brother-in-law did the drone stuff, a footage of that, where it's flying across. And what you don't realize is all this great drone footage of like cameras flying up really close to you when he's shooting that the guy my brother-in-law said look if this comes i can't go too close because it'll literally like scalp you it's like super sharp blades lying right at your head so when i did that it was like just fully running and being like you know yeah i don't want to get <laughs> scalped by the drone and uh my good friend william howell says scars are cool I I, yes. I, tend to agree. I think you mean scars are cool. Scars are cool. I I I'm uh, I don't have any tattoos, but I have some interesting scars. And I'll and I got a lot of tattoos. <laughs> Together we form a fully formed, I don't know, criminal. <laughs> tattoos and scars. James, what are you doing now? Brushing your teeth? Give us the update. <laughs> uh, 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 James, good morning. morning. You're what? I just got to the to the part where I could turn on the the, the movie. Okay. We're we're at about what minute are we at? Twenty nine minutes? minute mark. About twenty nine minute mark. All right. I'm at so this animation is showing some of the buildings that I made for my current project. I love you, New York, but you're bringing me down. Which I collaborated with Ted, but uh, yeah, Ted had me build a uh, a city of buildings that is taking up an entire room at my mother's house. And I wish I could show you. It's also taken up a good chunk of this place. But, yeah, it's a fun project. There are videos for that. That's all I'll say. Unless Ted wants to say something else about it. No. <laughs> no, no. Uh, it's just uh, if you've ever been to the Queens Museum and seen them, the little maquette of New York, Ethan's doing his own sort of red grooms on acid version of that. 
Um, and of course, he always has to destroy everything at the end, uh, dressed up like Godzilla, which I don't get. But I think well, that's dressed up like in my camera suit, which represents always Godzilla. <laughs> I have every reason to believe that project will be brought to fruition. You don't? You what? Say that again? I, I have every reason to believe that project will still be brought to fruition. I mean, you know, worst comes to worst, I'll just prop it out in front of my apartment and show it to the world on, you know, St. Mark's. No, it's going to be at the library. It's going to be at the library. There you Make go. Sure that there. Um, Tell us about the wolf mask. Oh, here's the wolf mask coming up. Yeah, this. So there's a, film, a few movies I watched that I got uh, inspired from. One is called uh, 20, Minute, uh, 20 Years of Madness, which is about a public access show in Detroit. And they had a guy wearing a mask in that, which I thought was awesome. And then the guy who did the Pee Wee's Playhouse, I can't remember the name of his documentary, but he was basically the art director. And he did these really amazing masks, and I it inspired me to make a series of my masks. This is the four-eyed wolf, which is kind of my alter ego, the id, if you would. And then uh, my daughter showed the one of myself earlier, which is uh, just a bigger. This is actual actual size of my ego. <laughs> Yeah, and I made one for my daughter, which I spent like a month doing. And this thing is like insane. And we were going to wear them on Halloween. I wore mine and she wore hers for all of like five minutes and was like, I don't really want to wear it. I just want to run around <laughs> and play with my friends. I'm like, but you wanted the, uni the unicorn wolf. So. You're a good father. Yeah, I try. <laughs> I like that pop-up book. Yeah, was that the sketchbook? Yeah. No drugs and the. Yeah, I, I periodically, I think it's good to just try to really throw something into the experimental pile. So, I even tried pop-up books. I wouldn't recommend doing a whole lot of those. Uh, this is talking about a part in the film where a bunch of my friends were doing heroin and some of them died. That's comedy. <laughs> unfortunately that still happens today not that i have a bunch of friends that aren't heroin but it's this thing in new york now like it's reverting back to this old new york 70s and drugs and you're seeing a lot more of it this whole section here where it's like fast animation with a lot of violence facebook uh made me cut out a bunch of the bloodier parts because it said it violated their terms wait what yeah, there was like, a, like the guy shooting himself in the animation and the stabbing. Those were too violent to post on Facebook. Yeah, Yo, come here, Bob. Wow. Ah, superstar <laughs> presence. Theo making up. I can hear Theo over there. Maybe he doesn't want to be on TV. And this is a video I made for a band called Desiderata that's playing now, which was a band on the Discord label. The backstory to that is uh, I made this video. This guy, Ted, who's, I mean, I'm sorry, Sid, who's actually the bass player on Seth Meyers. He's in the G8 band. And Sid was the bass player for this band, Desiderata, that was on Discord label. S Sid asked me to do a music video. I made the music video. He said, submit it wherever you want. I'm like, well, I'll submit it to MTV. I sent it to MTV. Not a great video. MTV put it on 120 Minutes. Because MTV, apparently, there's a, a block from dis uh, any Discord band is not supposed to have any videos on MTV because they have, like, a blackout for MTV. So the moment 120 Minutes saw a video from this label, they're like, put it on immediately. We were in Nashville when that played. We're all excited in a hotel room watching that on 120 Minutes. Come back to D.C., and then I'm in the doghouse. Everyone is like, how dare you put this video on a MTV? And I'm like, no one told me not to. I don't know your secret Kabbalah, like, cult handshake. No one told me not to put the video on there, and Sid asked me to do it. So, caused me a lot of grief. 
I'd say it's worth putting the video in the uh, film, so I did. I don't know if anyone cares about that story. <laughs> I never knew you were a sellout, but no. Damn. I, was a sellout. I didn't know the rules, and I didn't get paid. Sid didn't pay me. Label didn't pay me. MTV doesn't pay you. Not when you're like submitting a video. I do really love seeing a lot of this like punk rock stuff because it just reminds me of a time where people were. I feel like there was just a lot of freedom to be creative. I don't know that that exists now in our highly, you know, I don't know. The environment today, I think, is just not conducive to being creative. Um, why not, why not do you like, think that is? Uh, I just think everything is so polarizing, and I think that there is like, sort of, uh, I, 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 yeah, I, I, I just, it's un, it's unfortunate. But I think now, or I think back then, you could just be creative and make a lot of mistakes. Um, but yeah, today, no, I, I feel like um, maybe people put too much stock in what social media thinks about things. So, I, also I think. think People don't get bored because they're, you know, they're all like, they just pick up their phone. And so you don't have that time where you're just like, oh, I don't know what to do with myself. And then you start cutting up magazines. Right, right. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I miss that. I mean, I say to my daughter all the time, she's a, she's nine and a young punk in the worst way. Good. Um, she's yelling at me for saying that. <laughs> I feel like, you know, a lot of the time when she's looking at digital technology, she's really not expanding her creativity and experimenting, you know, you know, trying using her imagination. And I think that's where the big separation is, is this ability to really Colin. develop your imagination. Mm. I, I, I fear, like, I'm going to be one of those old timers. I fear for what the future will bring when the technology is just going to be in your eyeballs. <laughs> you know, it's like everyone watches these zombie movies and technology is what's turned us into zombies, you know? there's You don't have to worry about getting bit by anything. As soon as you're handed an iPhone, that's all I see walking around everywhere I go, you know? Yeah, there's the um, the Duda parade in Pasadena where I live, and um, they always do a lot of weird things. And I've all, my dream is to put together a group of like a hundred people marching all in step, but just looking at their phones. So that's in Shaun of the Dead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. But yeah, no, I, I that's something I really want to do. I, I don't think there's going to be a Duda parade though because of COVID, there's no Rose Parade, Rose Bowl Parade. So, you know, I've been fortunate enough to be able to see that every year. It's like three blocks from where I live. I just watch the parade. So. Don't you think a lot more people are doing cra arts and crafts now because of quarantine? Uh, I feel like we're going to come out the other side with all these like Joe Satriani, Stevie Ray Vaughan, guitar players, all these like quilters and I think it could be a good thing, actually, because it's a lot of crocheters and yeah, it's for yeah. all the like, you know, I recaned my entire dining room chair set. Oh, which, when would I ever have time to do that? <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. You know, so this I'm hoping. Where, hoping. <laughs> there's this whole thing where every creative is like, I wish I had more time to work on my art. I wish I had more time. It's like always hear this, and it's like dude, you're unemployed and you're stuck at home. What else do you have to do? I keep trying to have this conversation with people and I get that some people are very, you know, shell-shocked and depressed and they're, you know, can't really do anything. But I'm like, you're going to really be kicking yourself on the other side of this that you didn't take advantage. I definitely take advantage. I'm every day working on stuff, shooting stuff today and editing and, you know, it also makes you feel better. Yeah, no, I, I do this to Shane's face as much as I used to. Yeah. I, I, I've yeah. always, I've always believed that creativity is effectively therapy. I mean, that's mm -hmm. what creativity is. What, and one of the best speeches, just as someone who's a fan of award shows, I love award shows. Not only because, I, I, partially, you know, because I think a lot of them are terrible. 
So it's fun to watch and, and mock. But um, one of the best Oscar speeches ever given was from Steven Soderbergh, who when he won for Best Director, he specifically went out of his way. He said, I'm not going to thank the people. I'm going to thank them personally later, the people who were involved in this. But I want to, you know, basically um, accept this Oscar on behalf of everyone who does something creative every day. You should go. I'm. Um, you can. I'm sure you can find his speech, Steven Soderbergh's Oscar speech on YouTube. But it is the best Oscar speech ever because he didn't. Most Oscar speeches are just uh, uh, people listing off names of people that we don't know personally. And I think for them, it's good to hear their names, I guess, and get that acknowledgement. But he really used his time, his 30 seconds or whatever, to make a statement about creativity. And it's an awesome, I feel like you could do a whole documentary just about that speech. It was um, it was awesome. And also, I don't remember any other Oscar speeches. I never watch the Oscars. I always think like it's like rich people doing this. Hey, I did a good job. Uh, yeah. I just all, can't, like I try, it's like never, you know, I'm like, how hard is it for you to make billion dollar movies and have every expert and like, you know, like, and also it's most of those things, again, you know, it's like you live in Hollywood. I mean, you drive around and the Oscars are coming up, all the billboards are like, please consider this. It's like, dude, no one with no normal film can compete with that. Sorry, that's my... No, it's um, it's a uh, it's a bunch of bullshit, and I agree with you. I think um, awards are just a made up thing, which is why I made up my own award show. I'm actually going to throw something up about it. That if your movie has been reviewed on Film Thread this year in the year 2020, you're eligible for our 2021 award. Show. That's all it is. Like to be eligible, you just have to be reviewed on FilmThread.com. That's it, and an indie movie, and also be available commercially. So, uh, uh, you're eligible. You are um, eligible to be. I get back rubs. And I do want to add: I hate watching award shows, but I love getting awards. <laughs> That's a thing. I got so for Manny Camo in the uh, in the Hell's Half Mile Film Festival. I won the programmer award for this. And when they told me, I started to tear up and cry. And I was like, it's really, really was emotional because, you know, I spent five years really working on this film. So when somebody does acknowledge you, it really is like a huge thing. But yeah, my beef is like with the Oscars personally, because, you know, I haven't got an Oscar, so fuck you. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, I think it's just a bunch of phony bull. Also, it really screws up traffic in LA, which I didn't know until I lived kind of near where they do the Oscars. And they take over a street and they just basically put a tent in the street and they just like have this tent there for a couple weeks. And it just blew my mind because I was like, this is a public street. Like, how can they just be like, oh, well, we're famous, we're the Oscars, we're gonna build a tent on the street and just screw traffic for, for weeks while everybody else has to go on a different street? I mean, could I just like, could I just build a tent of my own on like Central Park West and be like, I'm just going to have an event here for a few weeks. Don't mind me. Yeah, that's what they do every year. So we're kind of stuck. What can you say? But yeah. I will say in the film, it, we were just talking about festivals and it was showing some clips of, uh, in the film, of festivals I was in with the other film because a lot of the film is taking interviews and public speeches I do and cutting out parts of that to build the basis of the film. And now it's showing Arturo Vega, which if Ted would kindly back up a little bit, we can see his Arturo Vega shirt. <laughs> nice. And I'd say that, yeah, like this is footage that James and uh, I think Chris shot in Mexico City or maybe Chris did when James and Chris were, the, were were with Arturo in Mexico City doing an art show. Um, yeah, James? Yeah, it was one of his retrospective. This one is, is back to Berlin. And this is Berlin. Yeah, it's a years. bunch of... And then it's showing uh, Arturo made a shirt that was famous as a disease antagonist mm -hmm. movement using the um, 
Ramon's famous shirt, basically saying that, you know, fame is the corruption of great things. And yeah, you know, I met Arturo Vega, who was the artistic director for the Ramones. Um, I met him when I was working at the bars, through the bars. We were doing all these art events and the owners who knew Arturo brought him in, said you should meet these guys. And then that's how I met James in that corner because he was living with Arturo sometime shortly after that, maybe a few years after Wasn't that. Wasn't that your first apartment in New York, James? No. Rubio was frozen. Oh. Yeah, I think James lived in uh, the famous Ramones loft, which is a lot of the footage you saw on that clip was from the loft where Arturo lived which was where the Ramones rehearsed. They did their silk screen printing and basically crashed because it was around the corner from CBGB's. And then when Ted came to New York, I introduced him to Arturo to buy some of his artwork because Ted needed some funds when he first moved here. Yeah. That's all you're gonna say, Ted? <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a backstory. So I introduced Ted and Arturo, they become fast friends and then Arturo's like takes Ted to the Life Aquatic uh, premiere, and I was like, "What the hell, man!" Like, <laughs> I would have loved to go and see that, but yeah, that's all. Sorry, so. bud. No, it's fine. You're a much nicer person than me. I, I have to say, um, you talking about film festivals just really makes me miss film festivals now because every festival has been some virtual event. Um, which is really, it's, you know, I mean, this whole year has been a dumpster fire, but in particular, I miss film festivals because that energy of movies that are untainted by um, sort of, you know, being turned into a commercial product, right? Like these are movies that you'll read a description in the program guide and you have no idea what the movie's about. Right, you just have no clue what the film is about, and there's that sense of discovery. Whereas, um, a traditional Hollywood movie, you know what you're buying, right? You know exactly what you're getting because the trailer just tells you it, 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 it telegraphs everything about the movie except the ending, which you can probably guess because it's a fucking Hollywood movie. But with independent films, especially indie films shown at film festivals, there's this this sort of raw creativity because these these movies have not been tainted by the marketing or your impression of the marketing that just makes it so much more exciting. So you really, I believe, with Man and Camel, capture that kind of energy, that energy of, I mean, I know you made a trailer for this movie and the trailer is actually on the Film Threat YouTube channel, but I, I don't even saw how you see the trailer for this movie and go, what the fuck? Like, what is this? What is this movie? So um, I just love that. I guess I guess what I'm saying is I really miss film festivals a lot and the kind of movies you would discover there. So Yeah, I mean, like, the thing I loved about the film festivals is getting those things that were unpredictable. Right. Know, like, that Hollywood doesn't want to offer. You know, right. luckily, I'd say it's yeah. like me and Ted and James had been to some festival in Texas. And then me and Shane, we did a pilot for a show called The Great Record Hunt, which was a travel show discovering music, local music through your local mom and pop record shops. And we went to a festival in LA, the uh, Dances with Films yep. Festival yeah. that showed at the Chinese Man Theater, which was amazing. And, you know, I think it's sad because it's like, I really enjoy that touring, like as if you're with a band, you know, promoting your film, meeting new people, you know, it's a very exciting thing. So for me, it's not just about submitting a film to a festival. It's about going and making connections. And even during quarantine, those people I met through festivals, I've been asking them to read my new script and give me feedback on that. And one shot footage from my new film in Texas because they live down there. So, yeah, I feel sad for the filmmakers that are coming out with films and having to do this digital mm -hmm. bullshit. I mean, yeah, it's great to do something, but it completely sucks. And at the same right, when you're going to film festivals, there's not the turnout that there was in the 90s. When I did festivals in the 90s, it was a packed house. 
you know, because you didn't have the option. But now because you have all the streaming services, rarely do people want to turn out to actually meet the filmmakers for these great right. films. So I'm going to like these giant theaters and I'm like, this is a thousand seats and there's 15 people watching my film, you know, and that's not just mine. That's like, I watched one festival. This guy flew from Italy to a little town in Texas and literally had nobody at two of his screenings. You know what I mean? I got people there because I was there and I knew people and I begged them to come out, but you know, you got to, not just now, you have to support the festivals. You have to go to the festivals. If you're a filmmaker, you have to show up for your film. It, it really is a dying thing. And it's super important for the ecosystem of independent films. It's so sad that the filmmakers don't show up. I mean, a lot do, but some don't. And it just like kills me. Cause there's, you know, I'll be like, where's the filmmaker? I want to talk to this guy, but we didn't show up. And I'm like, what an idiot. You know, well, now it's showing Rehoboth Beach in the film. It's a place I go to ever well, since I was a little kid. And there's Ted tripping. There was a clip of Ted. Well, what was, on what. I shouldn't say that publicly. <laughs> okay. I, I, it's just I, on life, tripping I, on life. I just missed that, what you were pointing out, Ethan. I missed that sense of community at a film festival and while I love building a digital community, I just don't think that that's, I think that that has to be supplemented by a real community, right? In real life. And I feel like that's what's missing is that, that real in-person community that, and I, you know, that, that supports indie film. And also I think that maybe things are evolving in a way that like maybe film festivals are less important. I think a lot of filmmakers put, you know, getting into Sundance is like winning a golden ticket into Willy Wonka's factory. But, but maybe that's not as important these days. And that's a good thing because I think that there are a lot of great indie movies that don't get into Sundance that aren't, you know, that aren't part of that ecosystem, that creative ecosystem. Cause I think partially a lot of Sundance is sort of a backdoor market for indie movies. Right. But it's kind of, also like a wrestling match where the outcome is determined before the match even begins. Meaning the movies that were going to sell were sold before they premiered at Sundance. So Yeah, but I'd also say like Toronto, Tribeca, Sundance, um, they're not as much independent films anymore as they used to be. They're pretty, like even yeah. South by Southwest. If you have Wes Anderson premiering a film there, that's not an independent festival. And exactly. from inside knowledge, it's like Toronto specifically, I had a friend who made an independent film uh, it's on Netflix and he submitted to Toronto and the Toronto head of the, the head of the festival said this film will not play. But because the guy had a very big agent, the agent forced to talk to the board and forced the film in, which meant like some other independent film. I mean, it's a good film. This film is good. But it just goes to show it really matters who your agent is. It matters who your people are. And that's the bigger reason for films playing in those festivals. I've had virtually no one I know who's, who didn't already have a connection to Tribeca has ever got into that festival. I've never heard of it. They always knew somebody and they always had some big connection to get them in there. So yeah. unfortunately, I still submit because it's kind of like you need to give them your money. They need your money. So you have to just give them your money. I'd rather just take a hundred bucks and throw it in their face and go, this is going to have no value. But I find more success in the, the medium sized film festivals. You know, there's a lot of great ones and really amazing programming. Hell's half mile. I got to say like the people show up for that programming is amazing. Wait, which one, you know, which one is it? Hell's half mile in, in Detroit, I mean, oh, you know, wow. Michigan and Hell's half mile. I in Basin, know about Michigan. that one. It's an amazing, amazing festival. And yeah. you like uh, Dances with Films, right? Dances with Films is yeah. awesome. And <clears throat> it, had, it had a good lineup of like different things and really well-made stuff. I think one of the, like going back to your topic on like in film festivals, you don't know what you're going to get. There was one little short comedy film that I think both me and Ethan really liked out of everything that we saw that uh, that time we were there. It was like very, very short, but like witty and pretty funny and kind of unexpected at the same time, like unpredictable. But, you know, it goes to show like, you know, what you don't know what you're going to get 
but until you show up and you know see for yourself that's right listeners out there you'll find the gems at festivals and they may not show up on netflix and hulu yeah that's yeah. true you got to get out there. There's a lot of reasons why films don't make it out anywhere. It doesn't necessarily have to do with quality. James, we asked before and you did not answer, but you first apartment in New York was the Ramones Loft, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You I mean, I was renting a room by the week for like three weeks until I moved to the loft. Nah. And James, yeah, it's interesting. You have facial hair in the dock. Now you're shaved, and Ethan was <laughs> shaved, and now his facial hair. It's like you switched bodies. Yeah. Like a bad 80s movie. <laughs> yeah. How do you feel about that, James? Yeah, I mean, it, th this movie actually, there's a lot of clips of me with all sorts of different haircuts. <laughs> uh, I, I didn't realize I had so many different haircuts. Now, I, I mean, I haven't had one in months because of this, you know, COVID thing, and then I just, I just decided I'll, I'll, I'll go for Gavin Rosdale. I hear there's a salon in San Francisco you can go to. That's oh, pretty wow. easy to like get a haircut. Can't wait. Yeah, right. We're going in the political realm here. <laughs> no, I just you can only get a only get a blowout. Only get a blowout. Yeah, right, right. A blowout. Go for it. <laughs> yeah. We're good with a blowout. <laughs> anyway, so in the film right now is showing me talking at St. Mark's Books with doesn't oh, exist anymore. St. Oh, Mark's doesn't books exist? And, nope, closed down. But St. Mark's book books was a a central part of downtown Manhattan. They used to sell my films. They sold my zines. You know the books that I put out, and it really was a hub for independently local publishers, zines, and artists of all types. And that part we were showing was a. Uh, I did a lecture on downtown art scene about maybe a year later it closed. Do you remember Kim's videos? I used yeah. to sell uh, my uh, films used to rent. I had like three or four titles that used to rent in wow. Kim's videos on Man. VHS. Yeah. Back in the eighties film threat, they, they bought copies of film threat this fall there. Yeah. I know. I used to see it there. That's crazy. One of the first places that bought it. That's kind of nuts. I used to put my zine out for free um, at Kim's video again. If you people don't uh, know that, that's it. It's like a motor zine. Yes. Man and Kim will check out that movie. And uh, one time I was in the Kim's video and this guy saw me putting a pile of zines down. And this guy was like tattoos, face, neck, everywhere. Like fully like, you know, store, steroid out guy. Um, this guy, Rick, 25 to life. And any of the New York guys might know who this guy is. He was like a singer for this band. And he was upset with the review. I gave him the <laughs> review and came up to me like, hey, uh, you know this guy, Bob Ashtray? And I'm like, yeah, he writes for the He's, That guy is terrible. I hate that guy. And he's like, oh, wait, so you're not Bob Ashtray? And I'm like, no, I'm definitely not Bob Ashtray. He, he mails his, his reviews in. The review I wrote was 25 to life is like taking your genitals and putting it into a mason jar. And that jar is filled with razor blades and running around the block once or twice. <laughs> so he was pretty upset. And he was like, oh, well, I don't think his review was fair. And our band isn't. Like and I'm like, eh, you know, like you could always send another one, another tape. And he's like, would you do that for me? Like, would you review it? Don't let that asshole die. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, sure, man. No problem. I would love to review your thing. And, you know, I never reviewed it. Never sent it. It was fine. But, yeah, I was totally freaked out. I was like one of those zine moments where, like, the zine is going to get me killed. But I did know, like, write all your music reviews under somebody else's name. And right now in the zine, it's, I mean, in the film, it's talking about the books. And it uh, had a Quimby's bookstore in Brooklyn, where I sell a lot of books and zines and stuff out of, which is the new version of St. Mark's Books, Wimby's Bookstore in Brooklyn. If you're an independent uh, writer and publisher and zine producer, Quimby's is the place to go. And it just showed some of that animation. That book is Again. brilliant, Ethan. Brilliant. Yes. Bought this book for a dollar. Xeroxed every, like, took frames out of the film and put it in there. 
like an insane person. <laughs> I love that. That's. I think it's like, you know, I, I do spend a lot of time obsessively watching art documentaries. And the thing that kills me is that they're very predictable. You know, it's a bunch of white people talking about other rich white people. And it's usually men. Um, and it's like this, the artist had his life and then he had some terrible hardship and then he overcame it. And the films are, you know, video cut, video cut. But they're never really like creative in the way of like, you know, the artist is. It never really maps their mind. So in Man and Camel, I really did make the editing jump around. It really does leapfrog from subject to subject. It does. It is very rapid fire. But that is also the way my brain is mapped. My other films are paced differently. They do have a very linear moving thing. But I wanted this film to really match my, my insanity. That makes sense. And right here is a part Shane shot. Of the birds, yeah, that came up earlier too. Some good footage of that. These are three D. I don't know if you can see that. I love your paintings, so, Ethan. Thanks, James. I'll Venmo you the five bucks later. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really James like, is I an like amazing your, painter I like too. Warship, like your war paintings, where the, the, oh, the war paintings. So I did a whole series of like. I do this thing when I can't fall asleep. I really try to come up with these scenarios I go back to. And one of them was always like tanks from different times battling. And I'd always be in the most advanced tank, like blowing away all the other tanks or being a warship, the most advanced warship, destroying all the Victorian ships. So I made a whole series of paintings uh, related to that sort of weird childlike boyish thing to help me sleep. James is an amazing painter. And uh, any of you people out there, look at look up James Rubio. He did a, a series down on the Bowery um, recently. There was one that were like, I would say, like kind of black figures, like cartoon my, mouse. Yeah, Is that how you describe mouse? it? Mickey Mouse is a really amazing painting. It's kind of like if Basquiat was a crackhead. You know, that's how I describe James in the most most affectionate way. Basquiat would have done better if he smoked a lot, lot more crack. Oh, I mean, I, I think he died of a drug overdose. I know. He should have uh, done crack instead of heroin. He'd be fine. Skinny. I think he was doing crack. Yeah, I think Probably he was. You know, you're crack. right. I'll just shut I up. Think he was I really doing like his artwork. Really. Uh, now the film is showing the most cheery, funny part, September 11th. Yeah. Because that's always fun. <laughs> Yeah, I was um, going to say something earlier. Uh, I think the key to being a good poet, a good filmmaker, a good painter is being a good drafts person. And I think one of the things I forgot about Ethan is that he can really draw. And he's kind of been doing all these drawings lately. And I'm just like, whoa, the guy could draw. That's amazing. No wonder he's good at making movies. And that goes back to what we we're saying about just practice, artistic practice by hand, working hard you know, working on your draftsmanship. And I think that translates as a metaphor to like writing scripts or poems or whatever. It's just that, that you know, ability to, to map stuff out and not everybody can do it. Everybody could eventually do it if they work hard enough, but not everybody can do it right off the bat. Like That's James the second nice thing I said about you. I know, I'll I'll you know five bucks later. The funny thing is, if you watch these films, Ted talks a lot of smack with me in the films, which makes for better film. But you know, we do love each other. We, I got to do it the right thing. There, I'm, I'm putting my arm around Ted. That's me holding Ted. I don't know if he feels it virtually. Aww. Nice. <laughs> Just looks like you're kissing to the right. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Um. Yeah, I think there's this thing of like a. Uh, complexity i like complexity in projects and also the fact that in the things i do i want them to link almost in a web so you watch the film oh this guy does a zine you look at the zine oh this guy does a public access show watch the public access show wait he does a podcast it's almost like this weird thing and along the way of this web 
of different projects that I link all together through promoting each other through these things. It then also shows like here's Ted's artwork, here's James' artwork, you know, here's the podcast Shane and Ethan do together. So I almost wish that, I mean, I have people that'd be like, oh, I've watched a bunch of your films, but someday someone will be like, I've seen everything you do, read all your books. I had a woman the other day who wrote a thing. It was like, I watched all your films and read two of your books. And I, that's great. But I wanted to be like, but have you read all the zines? And listen to that? <laughs> <laughs> It's not right to do, but. Oh, I think I'm telling the story about the guy that tried to rob us during the crack, crack oh, yeah. at DC. This is my favorite story. And uh, he pretended to have a gun in his sweatshirt. And you were all tough because you had spent one year in New York. That is not what happened. <laughs> right before and you were like, was, much to my chagrin, nine- you were like, you don't have a gun. Shoot me if you got a gun. And I was like, oh, that's the stupidest thing to say to a crackhead. No, I said, (laughs) if you had a gun, you would show me the gun. Don't tell me you have a gun and you have your hand in your pocket. You have a gun. You would have showed me. You don't have a fucking gun. But what Ted is failing to say is that right before we walked over there to DC Space, we were at 930 Club. We were at a show. Outside that show, there was a fight broke out. Some guy ran up behind me and sucker punched me in the back of the head. I remember that. And that guy was part of this gang in Richmond. What he didn't realize is that we were all together in this larger group of friends. So our friends and a couple of people we know who are very scary people basically cornered these guys, kicked the crap out of these guys. This one guy took this guy's arm the biggest guy in this group folded his arm behind him, other arm behind him, head butted the guy, the guy folded, and then the guy proceeded to try to bite his nose off. And that pretty much ended the whole thing. I mean, it was a full on old school DC like brawl. And so I was still pretty peeved from being punched in the head and after the brawl. And then we walked to DC space because 930 club and DC space are these two clubs very close to each other. And you walk between them to go, you know, like, oh, there's a show. People are at this one. It's a socializing thing. That's when the crackhead then says, I got a gun. And I'm like, dude, like, this is the wrong day. Wrong time to rob me. So, but yeah, to the guy's credit, he was like, yeah, you're right. I don't have a gun. And I'm like, fair enough. (laughs) And the guy walked away. And I'm like, have a good day. Have a good day. It wasn't (laughs) like I ran up and beat him up. I mean, he also did have like three friends on the corner who were like, could have been a problem, but yeah, it was pretty peaceful. I thought you don't have a gun. Yeah, you're right. I don't have a gun. And then we left. <laughs> I didn't curse him out or anything, but it is a funny story. And yeah, next time, next time for the viewer that you are being robbed by a crackhead who says he has a gun or may not have a gun, probably better just to give the cash over. <laughs> yeah, don't be like Ethan and challenge him. <laughs> Today's been a day where I've said that a lot. Don't do it. I said to her, her class, okay, this is a story about making films with real drugs and real guns in the city of New York without permits. You know, and I said to the students, yeah, you probably don't want to follow this lead. You know, I don't want to be responsible for you getting arrested. <laughs> it's cinema verite. It's beautiful. Everybody should do it. I know. I'm trying to shake things up a little bit. <laughs> You're just going to get in trouble at FIT. <laughs> How did, how did Dahlia? How did the students react to? Uh... Oh, they love Ethan. I think that because the the school is understandably teaches a very traditional approach. So I like to bring Ethan in to just kind of remind them that you can think outside the box and there are other ways to do things. And then he's got a couple great anecdotes that I always force him to tell. Yeah, the box has rejected me, so I have to live outside of that box. <laughs> What were some of the anecdotes that, that you that you imparted to the students? Um, uh, one of my favorite ones is he has this feature length movie that he made with a budget of two thousand dollars, and the money basically all went to buying drugs and getting a hotel room. Like the movie was made with no budget, um, and so I like that story because it kind of makes them realize, like, oh, I can make a full length movie without any money. Um, and then he talks about how. They, for this same this movie Soft Hustle that they had these fake guns and then I think it was like were they like these 
gang members that were like, oh, those guns are dumb. Let's give you real guns. And so <laughs> they had we had fake guns, and then some of the guys would be like, oh, just bring my real one. Like, <laughs> you'll see in the, in the soft tussle, there's a sawed-off shotgun. That's real. Like, you know, so and they'd so be they, like, they would just bring me like, oh, I'll bring a gun. You need guns? Because, like, one of the characters in the film was a gun dealer, a little, uh, uh, like a, yeah, like a hipster gun dealer. And he would have all these different type of guns. So we would always be bringing guns out of the bag and he'd be selling guns. Um, so, yeah, some of the guns were real. And we had to have spotters on the corner, you know, like, hey, cops. And then everyone would run away. I talk about that in the film. Oh, there's my daughter naked as a baby. Very first day she was born. <laughs> Ethan's she ready to go to film anything. <laughs> I literally film everything. I mean, there's a part in there where it talks about ex-girlfriends and all that. So it's like, clearly I film Everything. Everything. I mean, it's no deal. I'm glad your daughter clarified, though, that they are ex-girlfriends. Well, she also said, like, well, unless you're still, like, you know, you're cheating on mom or some smart ass <laughs> thing. Because she's playing video games, so I can say literally anything I want about my daughter, and she doesn't hear me. What Ooh, video- I'm give you 100 bucks. Oh, no, she's looking at me. Anytime I say money, <laughs> once I say money, it's like, boom, What? What? You're going to give me money for what? Oh, Ethan, tell the story about the free throw bet that you made with Blue and how you oh. lost. I bet her $50 that she couldn't make a basket. Like a basketball. she was missing. And then she kept going. And then, of course, she... I mean, her thing was like, well, I'll just keep going until I make it. And then she finally did make it, and I did have to pay her 50 bucks. So I do not bet my daughter. <laughs> no one should. Now here's a clip actually talking about my daughter. We're under the bed because there was a time where she was afraid of monsters under the bed. So I just lit the entire bottom of her bed so that it was like a glowing beacon with LCD lights, which I think was a very good way to destroy the monsters. My daughter has been a part of my films literally from the day she was born. And as you saw in the film, she's been a part of that. And we still collaborate and work together. She's taken some animation classes this summer, and we watch the tutorials here from the um, you know character design and all of that. Oh, here's the parts about ex-girlfriends. I definitely tried to make sure everyone's identity is well hidden. Nobody needs to be shamed. You know, private stuff is private. There's Do you a lot show of your things. butt in this film? Because in every film that I've ever seen of yours, you show your butt. I show my so in all of my films, there's always been he was on the a, bathtub. a nude scene, yeah. and in this one, there is me in the bathtub, but you only see my belly. Uh, so I I spared. I got a lot of complaints from family members of like, "There's Ethan naked again on the film." I wish you told us this would happen because I really don't want to <laughs> see my nephew naked or my grandson naked. There was there yeah. was literally like an earlier draft of your film where I think it literally just started out with you naked in the bathroom, like your yeah. butt to camera. <laughs> it was a, an amazing the film. In the, there's the the um, the figures. There was an amazing beginning of the film that we I totally took out where it's just me in the bath relaxing. You know, one of those things where you're like relaxing in the bathtub, and then my daughter just burst in the bathroom <laughs> and starts playing, and I'm like you know, not moving. So, I mean, it was really funny and I have that on Vimeo somewhere, but it didn't really play with the, you know, I wanted like the quick impact in the beginning and sort of that thing that Chris talked about early on is that, you know, for film festivals, you kind of have seven minutes to catch their attention. So I really wanted seven minutes of very high impact to up your chances to get into festivals. It's almost like you have to make different cuts for different things. Like festivals want your first seven minutes to be high impact. Distributors want you not to give away too much in the beginning. So they're happier with like a slower roll up. Um, But yeah, so these are puppets that I made with my daughter. I made a puppet of her too, me and the camera. (laughs) That's great. I feel like, you know, you get a lot of artists who are parents and they feel like they have to stop creating just because they had a kid. And I was like, that's bullshit. You can totally create with your kid. You know? My daughter used to paint my face as art projects there. So I periodically would go chase her around the apartment with my painted face. (laughs) I 
thought Dolly was going to do some sort of like, um, you know, uh, what do you call the academic thing for this? Oh man, you don't want that. <laughs> this is in Rhode Island. A lot of footage we shot there in Newport. This film really covers many, many states and countries. There's Berlin, there's Australia, um, I mean, Sydney, Newport, uh, Rehoboth Beach, Washington, D.C., um, Chicago. I mean, there's like, because this film really straddles my entire life, there's Bangkok, Thailand in there. And when I was showing the film at festivals, I was still filming these uh, filmmakers' guides. So documenting my film playing at the festival was also chances for me to get clips that I would then put into the same film, Man in Camo, that I would then show at the next festival. Well, that so was, was like, your, that was your MO for a while. You would find a, a art public art festival or you know, in Lisbon or Australia and then concoct a, a piece and then film your journey to that place, which I think is a great recipe for, you know, young filmmakers because in the process you get to actually like experience the world and live, live a cool life. You know what I mean? Instead of like trying to make a green screen studio in your apartment. Yeah. I mean like uh, James and Ted, the very first one we did was in, Berlin, um, where we did an art show in a little small gallery and did, you know, broke into buildings and did artwork. We showed some of that in the film and uh, we got to experience it. And then like James is somebody who's great to bring along on these projects because he's, I always call him the wrench because he just right away throws that monkey wrench right into your machine. Right away. Oh, this is all going smoothly? No, it's not. In Berlin... <laughs> Like we went to two airports looking for him. Oh yeah, we lost him. Sent yeah. us to the wrong airport. That's the first day James showed up in Berlin for an art project that I'm filming. I made a whole feature out of this, and then at some point he went missing for a few days. Then he was stayed inside the gallery and slept there when people were trying to break in the gallery. That's just one city. You know what I mean? So yeah, James. Me and James had a huge fight in Portugal and Lisbon. And I document all this stuff. So, like, you can go back and watch Dolls of Lisbon. That's on Amazon Prime. This is uh, Berlin, not New York. That's on Vimeo. You can watch for free. So, you know, yeah. If you're going to have a, a planned out, organized thing, but you want to make a film, bring James because he'll fuck it all up. In your I, I just wish that I was the filmmaker, you know, because in, in your film, it makes me look like I'm the bad person, you know? No, you never look like the bad person. But even in this film, there's a part where I'm choking James because we did a whole art project in it was in uh, Providence, Rhode Island. And this was like a huge art event where it got written up in basically every major thing in Rhode Island. All of their local press, it was written up. The bigger galleries in New uh, Providence came. And then at one point, James had this uh, safety pin that was open for some reason. He jumps on my back and slides down. So it's just like a knife stabbing me in the back. And I was, yeah, was already perfect, stressed but... out. And like The gallery was terrible. Like We had such a weird... I would never... We got in a fight. That was brutal. Sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. All right. The, these art projects, like, you know, we make the films and, and I show it. And it seems like it's easy. But, man, these things are terribly frustrating and hard to accomplish. And uh, that's why I wrote a book about it that no one will ever read. The third book that hasn't been published that covers all the uh, craziness and drugs and fighting and all of that. You do make everything look very easy. That's true. Well, Ethan works nonstop on this stuff. I yeah. Mean, I don't know anyone else that could make an hour and a half documentary about themselves. Yeah. I don't think I can keep up with Ethan's work, work ethic and like creativity ethic. <laughs> like it's every like minute. I feel like he's doing something or thinking about something to do. Yeah, I agree. Well, you guys know I have lots of new projects in the works. If I know, know that. And the crazy thing is it's all super planned. Like it's all planned to the minute, to the hour, by the week. I mean, you how, how far ahead do you plan everything then? Two, two weeks, three weeks? If we were doing like an overseas art project, we spend about two years in the planning. And then when we go, 
I do that because then I'm mostly filming. So we're already kind of talking to some people in New Zealand about doing kind of an older school thing where we go artists from around the world converge in New Zealand and work together and do workshops for kids and art events. So yeah, I spend about two years, but on these films, a lot of the times it's like, it's me as the only one filming. So I'm just constantly shooting everything, which is a weird perspective of not being able to fully engage because I'm behind the camera trying to get everyone to, Hey, do that again. What did you say? Can you say that again? You know, like in Berlin, I blew my back out like within the first week doing this animation where I would jump and take a photo, jump and take a photo. So I floated through Berlin, but then pulled my back really bad. So then one, we had to go find one of the uh, Germans we were with, had a nurse who gave me this really high power drugs, handed the camera. And then I had to have like Ted and my wife and other people shoot parts because I was just in so much pain. But we still filmed the entire thing and got a great film out of it. You know, that's these one of those films where our tutorial came with us. These credits. Oh, yeah, this is the end gra graphics. These yeah. are all from. Yeah. I need to have dance sequences right in all there. of my films, and this is my dance stuff. And these are really and clips from all of my films. <laughs> and me and Shane got all this on the little copy machine. End yeah, of the film. Good. Well, our new lives. That's yeah. the end. What are the final thoughts? And let's let's stay save Ethan for last. But everyone else, uh, I, I'd love to hear your final thoughts, and then Ethan, your final thoughts. So maybe start with James, and we'll go around. Well, I, you know, I was uh, initially hesitant to watch this movie, but uh, after I watched it, I got to say it's worthwhile. And, and my favorite parts are, one, the, the paintings, Ethan's paintings, and then, two, all of the old videos of Ethan, like through his teenage years and, and coming of age. I, I actually uh, really enjoyed that stuff. Thank you, James. Um Ethan, one of the things that we, the people that know Ethan love about him is that he's very pushy. And so <laughs> whenever he makes stuff, he's always like, have you watched it yet? Have you watched it yet? Have you watched it yet? Buy my book. <laughs> Buy my book. <laughs> have you read the zine? Um, so he was being pushy to get me to watch this. And it was kind of like, okay, 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 I'll watch it. Um, and so I watched it, you know, to get him off my back. And I was really blown away by how good it was. And I just, I, I feel like I was like texting him during the movie, at least at the end of the movie, where I was just like, oh my God, this is so good. This is so good. This is so good. Um, and the thing that I love about it, which is one of the things that I love about Ethan, is it's a movie about somebody who cannot stop creating. And like literally when there's no physical space in his apartment, he takes over a room in his mom's apartment. Uh, I even tried to, to get some space in, in the FIT film and media department so that we could put some of Ethan's stuff there because there's some extra room and my boss was like, no, we can't do that. Um, so it's just, he can't stop creating. And I feel like there's so many people who are so good at making excuses about like, oh, well, you know, when I have more time or after I do this or when my kid's a little bit older, and Ethan just like wakes up every day and he's like, okay, well, here are the 50 things I make. Um, and that's what I love about this movie is it really captures that energy. Um, be, helping Ethan work on this film, like shooting like additional stuff for him, but also like sitting literally right next to him as he's editing the film and also like providing uh, feedback on, you know, what to cut, what to add and stuff like that. I'm, I was constantly seeing the film evolve in different ways but even like watching it tonight i find little things that i didn't notice and it's very surprising that there's so many things that you can find enjoyable in this movie and like different aspects of ethan's life that are very entertaining and you know uh to listen about and just watch and i feel like that's also kind of how ethan's mind works like it's unpredictable and surprising and you'll never know what you're going to get out of him. But I just know that coming from a creative standpoint, 
it's kind of exciting just to like watch that all happen and that's kind of why i have a lot of respect for him because he just doesn't stop working and doesn't stop creating and it's very you know admirable and um inspiring yeah, it's hard for me to separate myself from some of this footage because having known Ethan since 85, probably. Um, but he's a way of life. Ethan is a way of life. And uh, when I moved to New York, I he said, what do you need? I'll get it for you. He got me a job, plugged me into this really creative community that you know I ended up dedicating the last six years of my life to um 24 hours a day basically but i think it's really inspiring to me um and hopefully for other filmmakers and i think film threat is a great um place to show this film because you know anybody whether you're in the midwest or you're on the coast or you're in some small texas town they can make a film like this if they have the urgent burning need to testify that ethan does you know, and I think it's inspiring in that way. He has this burning, fervent need to make stuff. And uh, it's just liberating. It's like, you know, the Ramones. It's like anybody can play three chords. And, you know, I, I think it's just, we need more of this now. And uh, just watching the film out of the side, on the side, I just, it's just amazing. So many parts like made me like forget I was even talking to you guys. So good job, Ethan, proud of you. Thank you. I'd say the uh, one thing I didn't say in the film is that throughout the film, I did lace in little Easter eggs of animation. Like I grew up reading uh, Mad Magazine and I think Chris was talking about how they had the little kind of animation on the side. And throughout the film, there's tiny micro animated stuff that you'd really have to be looking for and watching it again and i will say one is that the volcano part is a little man in one of the windows who's screaming in the fire um but i'd say if you watch the film and you have the opportunity to watch the film i would thank you personally i put a lot of heart work into it so any views i really do thank you for watching and the people who do watch it please review it You've got to have the metadata so more people see it. Wherever you watch it, just like the hell out of it. Even if you hate it, I don't care. Like it. <laughs> share it. A crazy cousin of yours who makes art, they got to see it and share it. Independent films live and die with this stuff. And I put enough effort into it that I really just want people to see it. So please spread the word. And Chris, you know, this is like an amazing opportunity. And I really do thank you for hosting this and letting this small voice be spread out there into the world, whether that's good or bad, that could be a big mistake, you know? Right. No, well, I, look, I appreciate it. Like this movie, like I said, I had to pause it at like, cause so much information was like, I felt barraged and I realized I was at the 55 second mark and I was like, holy shit, I'm in for a ride. So um, just, I love your creativity and, um, I, I'm so happy that we had the opportunity to, pr to present this to an audience and hopefully uh, if they discover this video later, maybe they'll, they'll watch the movie with the commentary, this is sort of our DVD commentary. Um, and I just, I, I, I feel like you inspire me. So, uh, I really appreciate, appreciate that. And I'm excited to see what you do next. I'm very excited. Um, well, I got a lot of weird plans next. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's awesome. um, and I want to thank everybody who came on, Ted, Shane, Dahlia, James, like, uh, thank you for staying on this whole time and, and watching this with us. Thank I'm you, Chris. Forward, thank Thanks you no, for having us. I, I'm really looking forward to, this is the kind of like fostering of community that I miss from going to film festivals. One of the best thing about going to film festivals is meeting new people and new creative people who inspire or even, I mean, you know, like the indie community, I'm not talking about like the movies that get released from the big distributors. I'm talking about the real indie film community is very supportive and I'm looking forward to that make, you know, coming back soon.
So yeah, come find me at the film festivals because I'll be out there in a few years again with a new project. And I'll be, I'll be with you. I'll be with you um, hanging out. Um, so yeah, this was awesome. This is great. Let's uh, thank you, everybody. Yeah, yeah thank you. Everybody. This was cool. And and uh, I, I just want to say thank you also to the audience that stuck with us, whether you watched for like 20 minutes or whatever. Just um, thank you so much. And uh, we have another watch party next week. It's for a movie called Max Winslow and the House of Secrets, which is a pretty cool indie indie film that is kind of, it's a indie, fil indie film that's like for the whole family, which you don't see a lot of family films um, uh, uh, done as done indie. So uh, really amazing. We're going to have the director, Sean, in the cast. So, but I want to thank everybody here for, for, hanging out on a Friday night and um, indulging uh, in some, I'm assuming everyone else is indulging. I can't be the only one. I then go now have to watch a Disney movie with my daughter. Ah. <laughs> Enjoy Mulan. So yeah. Yeah, that's what they've been talking about all day. Uh, but thank you everyone. This was awesome. And uh, see you next week at the film threat watch party. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everyone. Cool. Back rubs all the way around later in real life. Love you guys. <laughs> Love you. <laughs>